and getting involved. Um, if this works, there we go. So we've got women in aerospace medicine and we've got our um, social media tag at the very top there, but we're under the umbrella of um, AMSRO. And our mission is really to create opportunities for leadership and engagement. And we're a community for female and non-binary identifying aerospace medicine practitioners, researchers, and students and their allies. And our goal really is to promote diversity, representation, scholarship, and leadership in aerospace medicine. We host monthly conversations with high achieving women in the field, as we will today. We also match mentors and mentees, so be sure to check our website and raise awareness for opportunities uh, for everyone to get involved. So this is a few of us and we're, some of us are on the call today, so please feel free to, to message us if you have any questions about women in aerospace medicine or about the talk as well. So we've got today's talk, but don't forget we've also got our next webinar, which is already getting set up on the 13th of March. Um, and that's with Dr. Susan Northrup, so that should be really interesting as well. So today, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Chan who is a Chief Resident in Aerospace Medicine at UTMB, and we'll be talking a little bit about that as well as some polar medicine. So I will stop sharing my screen, Dr. Chan, if you'd like to take over. Thank you. Let me see if I can share my screen. Well, that's interesting, we had just gotten it done and now I don't see that option that we had before. Well, I'll share my entire screen and that's a, uh... Yeah, that's perfect. Can I see that? All right. Um, just trying to open up the chat box on the side. Well, thanks for joining in and uh, hearing me talk. Well, today I'm just going to talk a little bit about polar medicine and my experience down in Antarctica. Um, feel free to chime in with questions at any time. It's really, I'm just really going over some photos and kind of telling you guys a little bit about the experience and what's unique about polar medicine. Um, I'll hopefully add something new to those of you guys that have heard some of this before. All right, um, so this is kind of a picture of McMurdo Station where I was at, um, but kind of to give everybody some background. Um, this is you know, the continent of Antarctica and the US has three uh, stations um, there, the biggest being McMurdo Station. Um, the continent itself is governed by the Antarctic Treaty. The US portion of it is managed by the US Antarctic Program or USAP. Um, which is funded uh, by the National Science Foundation. So everybody that wants to go down there for jobs, probably aside from medical, is going to have to go through the National Science Foundation. Um, aside from the three stations, there's also two ships that come in and um, have researchers on board and they're considered part of the um, research team and in some respects we're responsible for some of the medical if they're close enough by to station. Um, all the stations are predominantly there for research. So McMurdo alone has about 150 plus research projects on a normal year, maybe not quite a COVID year. And, um, but the rest of the staff there are there purely for support. And any given year there might be, that might constitute 60 to almost 70% of the population down at McMurdo. So it needs a lot of support staff just to support a handful of scientists to do what they do. Um, and I put out there that there's about 3,000 plus personnel per year. That's at all three stations and rotating through the summer and winter seasons. Um, McMurdo, like I said, is the biggest. And at the height of their summer, they might have up, upwards of 1,200. So it's an uh, interesting population to have to take care of uh, in a medical sense. All right. And then um, I just kind of zoomed into McMurdo Station a little bit more. A lot of people don't know this, but McMurdo is actually not on the continent. It's actually on a little island right off the continent. So I guess in some ways you could say I've never actually been to Antarctica. <laughs> I've been off uh, on this island called Ross Island. Um, and what's neat about the location of McMurdo is it's the closest point that you can get a ship to have a direct access or fairly direct access to South Pole. And that's kind of why it's located where it's at. Um, it's also nice that within walking distance is uh, the New Zealand base called Scott Base. And both those bases are serviced by these two uh, airfields. The Phoenix airfield is the bigger one. It's just compact snow. They basically take this super heavy uh, machinery and just pack down the snow until it's hard ice for planes to be able to land on it, um, predominantly the C-17. And then Williams Field is the snow field. So the planes that land on that actually are equipped with skis. But you can kind of see the layout there. Um, and then this is just a quick map showing where all the field camps are. This is by no means where 
every single field camp, but these are some of the major ones that are there year after year. So you can see they're spread out all across the continent. Um, and we have medics that go to uh, some of the major field camps or go further out into field to support the deep field camps. And then we're kind of, we sit back at McMurdo and um, help either telemedicine type situations or if they can be evacuated to us, we further stabilize before evacuating out if necessary. So that's kind of how the grand scheme of it works. Um, so what's Antarctica like, or what does it look like? It looks like this. <laughs> when you're not on station, it is literally ice as far as you can see. It's white, it's quiet. Um, probably one of my favorite things about it is if you hike maybe 30 minutes away from station and you just turn a corner, um, the, sounds, the sounds of the generators from the station kind of fade away and it's just silence and it's unbelievable to hear that and you just see this and it's I feel like no pictures ever do it justice it's it's an amazing experience that I recommend everybody have a chance to do regardless of whether you're going down there for medicine or for you know just to be down there to experience um, what it's like to work uh, in such a remote environment um, so a lot of people ask how do you get there um, and there's really only two ways you can get there you can get there by plane uh, typically a military vehicle um, or you get there by boat um, if you're going there to work at any of these stations um, you'll either go through chile or new zealand um, if you go through chile you're going to palmer station which is kind of at the tip and technically outside of the antarctic circle and um, you get there by boat from chile and if you're going by um, if you're going to mcmurdo or south pole station you fly into christchurch new zealand and from there, you take one of the military planes to McMurdo. If you're going to South Pole, you'll stop at McMurdo and take a smaller plane uh, to South Pole Station. There are obviously a plethora of tourist opportunities, maybe not so much this year, but um, so you can take cruises and other things down there. As I mentioned before, it's, it's governed under the Antarctic Treaty. So there's nothing that any one country or government or entity can do to stop anybody from just showing up <laughs> uh, to any of these stations. Uh, especially the U.S. stations. So on a nominal year, occasionally um, tourist groups will just kind of drop in on the station. Um, and sometimes they require uh, medical support for some of their passengers or the commercial passengers. So really unique. Um, I thought this was a fantastic picture. This is the clothing distribution center, which everyone lovingly calls the CDC. It completely threw me off the first time I heard it. I was like, what are you talking about? There's a CDC in New Zealand and we get clothes there. Um, but when you go down there um, through uh, USAP, everybody is issued a certain amount of gear and you have to use that gear, uh, at least bring it with you regardless. Um, if you've been to a particular station before um, in a particular season, then you're allowed to potentially bring your own gear, but they don't want anybody to go like, oh, I got warm weather gear and take something that's com completely inappropriate. So um, these jackets are lovingly referred to as big red and almost everybody wears them. Um, during the winter time, people are so covered up and sometimes even uh, at the edges of summer, people are so covered up that you really start recognizing people by the way they walk because everybody's wearing <laughs> the same outfit. Um, there are name tags on there though that are prominently displayed, which is kind of nice also to help identify people. Um, so this is a picture of the C-17 on the inside. Um, it can be configured in a number of different ways, but I like this picture because it kind of highlights the fact that it's both a passenger vehicle and a cargo vehicle all in one. Um, it's not super comfortable, but it's not uncomfortable either. If you're flying on the C-17s, that's the bigger military aircraft. Uh, it's about five and a half hours to get to McMurdo. Um, with, and there have been times where and it's a big enough vehicle with enough fuel that it can get there. And if it has to, if it can't land for whatever reason, it can actually turn back around and head straight back to New Zealand. If you're flying on the smaller LC-130, um, it doesn't hold nearly as much cargo and is predominantly for, it does smaller cargo and then passengers as well. They actually have a cutoff point somewhere um, over the water where it's a, a if they pa fly past that point, there's no return. So they have to find a way to land. Um, so some unique things. This is a picture of the C-17, uh, the same one that I took. Um, it's a really large vehicle and I don't know how to, I, I don't know if I have a picture in here that has a person standing next to it, but it's gigantic. Um, majority of the supplies, uh, especially this year came by air only. There were no boats that came in this year. They do have barges that bring in these large containers um, filled with uh, supplies for uh, 
South Pole Station, um, McMurdo, obviously, and then also uh, some of the supplies for Scott Base. And this is on the day that I arrived there. It was negative 45 degrees. Um, so it was a really cold day. Uh, on those days, a lot of vehicle problems can occur. And there have been times where as the, uh, the plane's flying in, they have a problem with like a cracked windshield or something else where they either have to abort flight or if they've already landed, then they have to wait until supplies can come in so they can fix it. So, but uh, definitely harsh conditions. It's not always like this, um, but this was kind of my welcome to Antarctica experience right there. <laughs> And so uh, McMurdo Station um, is, like I said, the biggest station and kind of where um, all the field camps are staged out of, um, where South Pole is staged out of. It's a gorgeous station. Um, this is a kind of a view from it uh, from above at night. Um, and it, it, so I say gorgeous. It's beautiful in its own sense and it looks beautiful here. But if you want to see it in daylight, it's a mining town. <laughs> um, it was set up uh, in the predominantly built up in the 1950s. And um, a lot of these buildings are circa 1950s um, from the US Navy. And so it was built for functionality and not um, beauty. And I wish I had a, I don't think I have a picture of Scott base on here, but if you look at the New Zealand base versus the US base, there's just a um, very drastic difference in the form and function. Theirs is purely science-based. If you think of any of the nicest science field camp facilities that you could think of, that's kind of how there's lo theirs looks. Um, I don't know what that new George Clooney movie was where he was up in the Arctic, but their, their, their base has that kind of feel. Our base really does feel like a mining town. Um, and in the summertime, the um, snow goes away and it turns kind of really muddy and feels like a mining town. Um, so what is it like? Um, for those of y'all that might not realize this, Antarctica is a desert. So there's not a lot of precipitation but they get snow. And um, the reason they get snow is it's blowing in from um, other areas where there is precipitation. So McMurdo rarely gets actually snow coming from, uh, from above. It's just being blown in from the side. Uh, I don't know if this adequately shows it, but it blows by pretty fast. This is the ground and that's all that wispiness is snow blowing across it. So you can see it like that. Um, Internet, this is so funny. This is actually in their ID department and is a great depiction of how the internet works there. Um, they say that the bandwidth on station is roughly the equivalent of like cell phone LTE coverage for everybody on base. So not a lot of bandwidth. Um, obviously there are certain subgroups. I'm sure IT has their own system where they get a lot more additional bandwidth and NASA has a large presence there. And I'm sure they also have additional bandwidth from their own um, methods. But in general, everybody shares this large section of where they think they have all this internet, but it's actually going through this tiny little link um, to the rest of the world. And so um, one of the nice things about being down there, uh, and it takes some getting used to, is that you really are unplugged almost all the time. Um, and so people don't carry around cell phones, maybe except to use as cameras, uh, if that. Um, you're not online very often, you might not follow the news, so you don't know what's going on with the rest of the world other than for little snippets. Um, but it's really nice. And, and when people sit down for a meal in the in the cafeteria area, no one's carrying phones to text or talk to other people, you really are in the moment and you're having conversations with the people you work with. So it's that in itself is also a really um, unique and I think a very favorable experience. Let's see, so the rest of these slides that I have are just kind of pictures of what the base looks like and, and some of the and medical section specifically, but they have a galley, it's big. Um, uh, it supplies all the food. So when you go down there, if you're on contract, you don't worry about bringing in any of your own food or buying food. Um, you, everybody eats the food that's provided for by the galley and they have hours, um, but they have 24 hour supplies where you can grab and go too. So, and the food's pretty good. They, they do a good job of trying to accommodate for um, everyone and, and have some variety. Um, they do have a coffee house and I put this picture in here because one of the things I really like about um, the station and this probably applies to all the stations is that uh, they like building a sense of community. And so if you want something, um, you just kind of have to make it happen and you have to volunteer for it. So they don't hire baristas to go down to Antarctica to serve 
the community's needs. Um, but they do have these facilities and somebody shipped down a, um, or maybe even USEP shipped down some coffee machines um, and other people will bring their own coffee and you volunteer uh, to be a barista and you just, whatever hours you're available, it might just be from seven to 8 a.m. in the morning or you might choose a 10 to 11 shift. It's, it's never open for large chunks of time, but you volunteer your time um, to kind of serve the community and talk to people. Um, that kind of holds true as well. They have two bars. Um, those get paid nominally by uh, through USAP, but they the people for all intents and purposes really are volunteering to uh, serve as bartenders too in the evenings to um, make the environment, uh, I guess, feel more like a community. Um, some of the wildlife you'll see there, there's Waddell seals. You'll see um, those will come out between um, like in the October, November months. Um, and they actually uh, will have pups on the ice that you can see. Because of the Antarctic Treaty, you're not allowed to get anywhere near any of these animals. You're not allowed to interact with them. You can't save them if they're hurt. Um, multiple times uh, when you see the people will say that sometimes the penguins will come through camp and if they stand in front of your door, you, you can't move them, you can't do anything. You just have to wait or find another entrance. Um, so that's kind of fun. I don't think I put any of the pictures of the penguins in there. Um, this is a skua. Um, it's a large, it's the equivalent of a large aggressive seagull. Um, and uh, everybody who goes down there will recognize at least the name, if not what these look like. And uh, they come to recognize what the blue cafeteria trays look like. And so if someone walks out with one of those trays, they will come down and take you out to grab whatever food uh, they can get. So, and they'll eat just about anything. Um, there are, there's a love hate relationship with these animals on base. And so uh, they also have um, a community exchange of like items. People don't like wasting down there. If someone's spent the time and energy um, and fuel to bring down some sort of equipment, clothing, gear, whatever, um, you don't want to just throw it away to the trash if you're done, if it's still reusable and potentially useful for someone else. And so they have something called the SCUA, which is um, kind of like a market, free marketplace where you leave items that you no longer want and someone can just come by and pick it up. Uh, so that's kind of neat. So this is what the McMurdo General Hospital looks like. And it really is a hospital in the fact that it has just about anything you need to take care of a patient in-house 24 hours. Um, it is a lot bigger and has a lot more functionality than I imagined when I first got there. Um, I thought I was going to be working in like a small little clinic with maybe some adjacent tents. I, I really didn't have an idea of what it was gonna be like, but um, it's a fairly large building. It's across the street from the main building. It takes five minutes to go from the main dorm to, to this building. Um, so it's really centrally located. And the only one with a red roof. Um, it has an exam room, just one. Um, so you can see patients just like in any clinic. Um, and you can kind of see that, that they have, it looks like a typical exam room with all the supplies you would need although uh, the walls and the cabinets are still on the older side. Let's see. And this is a view of the ward. The ward um, in this configuration, I think had like five or six beds, but can hold up to uh, nine or 10 beds. Um, I don't know the last time they ever had that many people in house that they'd have to house like that, but in an emergency situation, they could house a number of people overnight. And while I was down there, we did have a couple of patients that had to be obsed uh, or admitted to the hospital. Um, this is kind of a picture of the trauma bay. So they actually have a two bed trauma bay that can be expanded up to three in um, emergencies. You see a crash cart. And if you look, it looks like your typical trauma bay. Once again, you have all these supplies, including any type of fluid that you'd want, all the IV settings, um, uh, just about anything you would need to take care of them. Um, they have a physical therapy department. It's fairly uh, big and probably the most used department there um, because a lot of the injuries tend to be uh, musculoskeletal in nature. Um, and so uh, the physical therapist tends to be one of the busiest people in the medical uh, group. They have a pharmacy as well. Um, it's interesting, uh, just like with the ISS, uh, you have to deal with the issue of expired meds all the time. Uh, most of those medications, despite the fact that there are many, plane, many planes that come back and forth, um, a lot of that uh, space allocated on the planes aren't for medications. Um, uh, 
uh, and are allocated for other needs. And so most of the medications actually come in on uh, ships, on the shipping container that comes in once, maybe twice a year. And uh, as such, when they purchase these items and then they pack them onto the containers, it can be a year before it actually gets there, despite the travel time is really not that, not that long. Um, so we do deal with expired meds and we do use expired meds if necessary. Um, but for the most part, we try to have a limited supply of um, whatever you would need. And most of them have a decent shelf life of six to six months to a year before um, we have to do something else about them. Um, they also have a hyperbaric chamber, which I was really surprised about. So there are divers that go down to Antarctica and there's divers every year uh, for research, um, predominantly for research. Uh, and it's a pretty big dive team. And so because of that, we do have to worry about DCS from time to time uh, and other issues. And so we have a dive chamber that is fully functional, uh, also brought in by the Navy initially. Um, so it's been there for a while, but it, it works. And they probably don't use it every year, but I would say every two to three years or so, they'll have to stick someone in the chamber. Um, there's a full lab. Um, well, there is a lab. <laughs> And it has a lot of equipment in it. And a lot of it, you know, once again, is dated equipment. Um, in one of those cabinets back there, it's full of old centrifuges that nobody had the heart to get rid of. Um, so there's probably like 10 different centrifuges down in there um, that's kind of been collected over time. But there's stuff for microscopy, there's an iStat machine and some other um, point of care type blood studies, um, UA and some other, you know, monospot type tests, rapid strep. Everything else we can uh, send out to Christchurch to a, a lab that's contracted by uh, USAP to run all our major labs. Um, if you get the opportunity to work down there uh, in a medical capacity, what's really, really great about this is um, you're expected to do everything. So you are your x-ray tech, you are your lab tech, you are your phlebotomist. Um, so you get an opportunity to learn all of it. And, you know, Back in the day in medicine, that was always true. But nowadays with training the way it is, a lot of people don't see the inside of a lab as a medical student and they don't do their own UAs and they don't um, do their own peripheral blood smears. And so it's a great opportunity to practice some of those skills and at least understand uh, some of the limitations that there are. Um, I think it makes you a little more well-rounded as a physician for sure. Um, they have a huge dental suite actually. So dental is one of the um, top problems that you'll see there. And if you go down there working as a physician, you're bound to have to encounter some of the dental emergencies. They do have um, typically someone that has some skills as a dental hygienist to do some basic uh, cleanings and work there for people that are there for a prolonged period of time. Um, and they have a dentist that comes down for about six to eight weeks or so uh, every year. Um, to help out, but the rest of the time uh, you're kind of on your own and you patch them up as best as you can. You might do some telemedicine, phone a friend to ask um, what you need to do just to get them by until the dentist arrives potentially months later to um, do some more definitive care. Um, but they can uh, do almost anything down there if you have the skill set for it, um, including making molds um, for you know, uh, teeth biting. Um, they have uh, ways to fix uh, crowns, bridges. Technically, they can do root canals down there if you have the skill set for it. Um, so it's definitely a full fledged uh, dental suite. Um, this is radiology. All you get is uh, x ray and ultrasound. Um, it doesn't make sense to spend the money um, on something uh, as big as a CT machine. Um, it takes a lot more technical ex expertise to have someone trained on something like that. And probably the biggest reason why they just can't do some of those things in a remote environment, even if you had um, the money, is it just takes too much maintenance, constant maintenance on some of that equipment. And it's just not practical to be able to do that. So yeah, you get to run your own x-rays here. Um, there's a nice book on the side that tells you how to get your views, um, how much uh, radiation you should be using each time. Um, and then you read your own films. We do send all the films out uh, to UTMB to the radiology department. They do a final read for us. But by the time, our turnaround time is typically expected to be 24 to 48 hours. So you're really doing the wet reads and, and basing your practice based on what you see on your reads um, with confirmation sometime later. 
Um, medical is lucky. It's one of the few departments that has its own little kitchenette, um, which doubles as a conference room. I don't know if you can tell in the back, but there is a TV, a large TV screen in there that we allow for telemedicine. So on the off chance that you need to consult um, some sort of specialist, that we have capabilities of doing that and we can consult. Um, we have a group of specialists that are designated as such. Our capabilities. Um, the video and, and audio though are fantastic. And usually if we do have to do something like that, um, we let IT know and they shut down the rest of the internet for everybody else. And so we have the dedicated LTE bandwidth <laughs> for our particular project. Um, this is a fish hut. And this is kind of how, if you need to expand medical in any way, um, this is how you do it. Rather than the tents that I envisioned, they have these little huts that they can um, relocate near medical and serve as additional space. And so this, this particular fish hut, number 15, is put right next to medical. Um, because this year we, to see COVID patients, we want to make sure we isolated them from the rest of the hospital on the off chance that someone um, came in with COVID symptoms. We didn't want to contaminate the rest of the medical building because it really is where all our supplies predominantly are. Um, so we had this, it um, had like a little heater in there to keep it warm, but it got really chilly in there and you were seeing patients. Um, and sometimes you had to OBS them for a little while while we run their COVID test to see if they were, their rapid test to see if they were positive or negative and if we need to isolate them further. Um, this is just the medical team. So especially this year, there was a, a lot of downtime um, in the medical department. I can go into that a little bit more, um, but this is one of the pods that they had bought for isolation um, in case they need to medically evac someone with a severe COVID symptoms out. Um, but there are a lot of considerations that you have to kind of take into it that feed into the idea of polar medicine um, and working in such an extreme environment. Um, this is a pretty sturdy piece of equipment. It's um, geared towards the military to be able to evacuate. And you can drag this across the jungle supposedly, um, but it's still made out of plastic. And in some of the cold weather areas, um, especially down in South Pole where it can be negative 80 majority of the time, um, that plastic's just not gonna hold up very long, even for that short five minute trip from the door to the helicopter or the plane that you're doing the evac in. Um, so there was a lot of issues about um, being able to use something like this and they just had to troubleshoot it. And that's kind of what you do. You plan for the worst and hope for the best most of the time. And that's true with any extreme environment that you work with. Um, this is just one of the other things that we do aside from running a clinic in a hospital is that we do a lot of occupational outreach um, preventative medicine is a huge deal there. For the most part, we send fairly healthy people down there um, and UTMB does screen everybody. Um, but if that one person is the only person that knows how to do a particular job and they need them down on the ice, um, uh, NSF and USAP will still send them down there regardless of how high risk they, they may or may not be from a medical standpoint. Um, so we do try to provide um, occupational outreach, um, whether it's hearing conservation talks, um, this is a stretching exercise for the, the Traverse team who actually drive and create a pathway every year from McMurdo Station to South Pole Station. They pull the majority of the supplies down there, including fuel bladders, and it takes, it's about a four week trip for them to get over there. And they do it um, three times a year to get all the supplies that South Pole needs for the year. Um, there is a fire department. They have their own ambulance. There's two fire trucks um, and they do provide transport. Uh, you can call 911 down there, just like anywhere else. Um, they all respond um, and dispatch to help and bring them to medical for us. Um, and I think this might be my last slide. So some of the unique medical aspects about uh, polar medicine is like I mentioned before, um, dental emergencies, a lot of people don't think about it uh, as being such a big deal, but it is down there and it can be debilitating enough um, that it can prevent someone from doing their job. Um, the top three things that you'll see there on a normal year is um, musculoskeletal injuries, um, something that they like to call the CRUD, which is just upper respiratory illness. Uh, this year, because of COVID and all the quarantining that they did um, and the preventative measures that they took, we actually saw next to none of that. Um, and part of that is because of the quarantining that we did in Christchurch prior to deploying down to McMurdo. And another part of it is people were just kind of scared and didn't, probably didn't want to bring up the minor sniffle issues because they didn't want to run the risk of being um, uh, 
losing their jobs and being shipped uh, out um, to prevent COVID from spreading on station. Um, but definitely the third on any year is easily dental emergencies. Um, and although we do do dental screenings for everybody that goes down there, they get Panorex or full, uh, full uh, x-rays of their mouth um, ahead of time. Um, a lot of people have either hardware that fails um, because of the cold uh, and uh, extreme temperatures, the contraction of, the, of whatever's in their mouth. Um, one of the biggest examples and you know, one of the outreaches that we do is we talk to people early on and say, hey, if you're coming in from the cold, don't run straight to the galley or wherever you're at and drink a hot cup of coffee because that huge temperature change is what causes teeth to crack or their crowns to crack or their bridge to come off or the glue to dislodge. And so um, dental emergencies do happen and we probably see um, more than a handful every week. Um, you do supervise the field camps, uh, visiting ships. We provide most of the medical care for Scott Base. They're not a big base. I think um, at the height of their summer, they might have 100 to 120 people on their base. They have a medic there that takes care of all their basic medical needs. But if they have anything more concerning, they'll consult us and they'll actually come visit us at our uh, clinic uh, to be seen and, and cared for. Um, it's a small environment, but it's definitely hazardous and it's next to an active volcano. <laughs> I don't know if a lot of people realize that. Um, and so we do have mass casualty um, training um, that anybody on base can volunteer for. And we train, I think five different teams to do special activities and they do this training every year so that in the event something uh, were to happen, we would have additional personnel to help out. Um, what's really interesting is that a lot of people that go down there, um, have some, not a lot, but there are a number of people that go down there that do have medical backgrounds that don't go down there to be part of the medical team. They might be working, um, for one example, the current uh, recreations coordinator down there is actually an oncologist uh, slash hospitalist. And she spends seven months, five to seven months out of the year down at McMurdo serving as the recreation coordinator. And then the rest of her time uh, back in the States uh, as a hospitalist and an oncologist. And it's just her way of decompressing and, and having a break. And so, um, there are other people with medical training that we can, um, we ask everybody to notify us when they go down there, if they have any medical backgrounds so that we can pull on their experience and expertise if needed in a uh, mass casualty event. Um, good question. Are people masking up right now at McMurdo and Scott? Um, yes, they are to a certain extent. Um, they have these three levels of COVID precautions, uh, green, yellow, and red. So anytime anybody new comes to the station by either plane, um, helicopter, whatever, um, the, play, the station goes into yellow, COVID yellow. And everybody has to practice social distancing the same way that we would do here, masks, six feet away. The cafeteria actually runs hours where you're assigned to a, a certain time slot. And that's when you go either pick up your food or you could eat um, where there's only two to a table. Um, and that lasts for seven days until the last person's there. They also do, um, uh, temperature checks for all the new arrivals during that same period. And as long as everybody's clear, there are no cases or concerns for uh, COVID, then uh, they head back into green. And then it feels like the way the world worked, you know, a year and a half ago. So uh, that is nice. It is frustrating though, because they do have people um, coming in fairly regularly. Um, and so they do have to go into yellow for a large part of their time this year. Um, let's see, they are the same note as the mass casualty incident training. There's also a walking blood bank. So we ask that everybody um, before they deploy down there, just say if they're interested in being in the walking blood bank, that's all we wanna know. We don't do anything uh, more than that, but we keep a list. And so if uh, something were to happen, we can quickly mobilize people and have them come in. And there's a well-documented procedure on how we would um, manage that. But it's, it's a very old school way of doing it. We literally drop, blood drops onto a card of the two people and, and see what happens and decide if they're compatible or not. There's not a lot of extra screening that we can do. Everybody going down there though gets their blood pre-screened as far as um, for any major diseases um, or viral infections that we'd have to worry about. Um, and then medical evacuations are really unique. A lot of people don't realize this, but while you're down in McMurdo, it actually takes longer to medically evacuate from McMurdo station than it does from the ISS.
Stand by, everyone. You can be at someone with probably definitive care. So pretty impressive considering how far away they are. Um, however, at McMurdo, your best case scenario, all things, all the stars aligned in the equipment there takes about five and a half hours um, to potentially get to near definitive care. And it's probably closer to nine hours to 24 hours. So um, I think... Michelle, we may have, uh, due to sunspot activity, missed the uh, estimate of evacuation time from the ISS back to ground. Could you repeat that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was saying that the ISS, um, on a best case scenario, you can evacuate someone from the ISS to ground in about three and a half hours. That's the time that we usually kind of quote. Um, and that might just be This information clearly is highly sensitive and difficult to distribute. Please stand by. Uh, for someone to evacuate from McMurdo to New Zealand. So um, are there doctors on call for telemedicine needs 24 seven? Yes, there are. Um, and there is a running list. The funny thing is not all of them know that they're 24 hours on call because <laughs> it happens so infrequently. So they're kind of told at some point in time, hey, um, you're on call for polar medicine, you know, for, and it's usually the same couple of specialists because they understand the needs a little bit better. Um, but not everybody that we consult really understands the type of equipment and the environment that we're working in. Um, so a good example is um, a few years back, there was a stroke on station and they consulted neurology and they're like, hey, we have limited resources. What do you recommend that we do now while we mobilize a medical evacuation? They're like, well, I think we need a CT scan. And they kept going, we, we can't do a CT scan. They're like, well, get them to the hospital and get them a CT scan. And we're like, it's going to take six hours <laughs> to get, it, um, get a CT scan. And so um, they did not end up saying uh, TPA. Uh, they basically co uh, did antiplatelet therapy. Um, aspirin, um, and they do have some, uh, it depends uh, on the year what type of antiplatelet meds they have there, but they do have some there. And so they, I think in this case, they might've used something like clopidogrel or the equivalent uh, to stabilize until they could get them to Christchurch and into a hospital where they could get the CT scan and the MRI and the carotid Dopplers and all sorts of stuff. So, um, so technically, yes, there's 24 hours, seven, 24, seven, um, 365 days a year consult services available, but um, not everyone you get is going to actually understand and they might take a double or triple take when you tell them where you're calling in from. I have a question for you and everybody else feel free to start throwing your questions in the chat. Um, so my question is kind of a basic overview question of kind of how you felt rotating through Africa, uh, Antarctica, not Africa, <laughs> Antarctica impacts and prepares someone for a future as an aerospace physician, kind of like what tangible skills translate between the two, in your opinion? Yeah, um, I think as a flight surgeon or anyone practicing, you know, aerospace medicine, it is probably one of the closest experiences you're going to get um, to taking care of um, astronauts in a unique environment. And I say that for a number of different reasons. One is um, you have these field camps, they're even more remote with very, very limited supplies with maybe one person that's trained as their medical officer. Um, and that doesn't necessarily mean that they have a lot of medical skills, but most of these deep field camps will have one person designated as their medical officer. And you are in charge of their training and in charge of helping them make sure they have an appropriate med kit um, and kind of giving them the little bits and pieces of you know what to do in an absolute emergency and how to get a hold of me, and so that's that's um, part of it. Um, part of it is the medical evacuation aspect um, that I just kind of mentioned, uh, and a lot of it is that you really are doing occupational um, operational medicine, which is very unique. Um, and what's and by what I mean by that is you're not just considering. You, of course, you're always considering the patient and you want to do what's best for the patient. Um, but what's best for the patient as a whole is not always what's best in a medical or the most conservative medical perspective that we can do. Um, so let me give you an example. Um, let's say you had a patient that um, got a work-related head injury. Nothing too bad, but they're obviously concussed, right? And um, 
in any other situation in an ER, you would immediately CT their head. And uh, if they're actually having, you know, nausea, vomiting, potential vision changes or something else, you would keep them and you would uh, want to OBS them and have neurosurgery on call ready just in case they have to do anything, right? Um, obviously in Antarctica, that's not an option. And some of the things you have to consider is, you know, if I'm medical, evacu evacuate this person out, um, who's going to do their job function, especially in a year like this year where they really had a skeleton crew, everybody is essential. Um, if you take that person away, it's going to take a while to replace them, uh, if at all. And so um, if you're that conservative and you're like, well, let's just evac them out because that's really medically what's the most conservative move and the best for the patient. In any other year where they can potentially come back, um, maybe it's not quite as big of a deal. Um, you have to consider the fact that uh, they lose their job for this. So if you send them out, that's it for them. Um, so from a personal standpoint, not just an operational standpoint, that's the big concern. And a lot of them just don't want to leave. This is where they make their money for the season and they go back and um, live off of that for when they're off season. Um, if this person was going from McMurdo and heading to South Pole Station, there's a lot of other considerations you have to take into account. Um, South Pole Station is at a higher elevation. So you're actually thinking, have to think about mountain medicine and altitude based illnesses. And so someone with a head injury, if they're ready to deploy or they're supposed to deploy to South Pole Station, how do you know if it's not symptoms of the concussion or slow head bleed versus something like high altitude cerebral edema? Um, so those are some operational considerations you have to really take into account early because you can't just say, well, we'll just see. And if you get worse, we'll just bring you back. Um, that's not an option. You have to plan ahead and kind of weigh all those things. Most medical, major medical decisions, including medical evacuations, are not one-sided. Medical doesn't always have the final say. We have a lot of say, and um, they take our considerations to heart, um, but you always let uh, NSF and USAP um, kind of know the situation because they have to weigh it in uh, from an operational standpoint. They sometimes have more data points than you do about how essential this person is um, and if they're willing to take that risk. And if that individual obviously is also willing to take the risk um, to stay and be observed rather than evacuated out for more definitive care. Thank you for that. Yeah. Ashley has a great question about your kind of day-to-day -day ops. Ashley, do you want to ask your question directly to Dr. Chan? You can unmute and video on. Yeah, uh, I was wondering, um, like, what what does your day-to-day -day life look like while working um, on the base? Like, how many patients do you typically see a day? Yeah, so once again, this was an off nominal year. On a normal year, they'll, each medical provider can see like 20 to 35 patients a day. And majority of that is like pretty quick. Um, I have a little bit of a headache or um, I have runny nose or my ears clogged up, um, simple things. Or, you know, my elbow's starting to hurt. Do you have any recommendations or an ice pack or something I can do in the meantime um, because I have to get back to my job sort of thing. And so you see a lot, but they're not, they're not, um, you don't see a lot of severe or high, highly critical cases uh, to that extent. Um, this year, we maybe saw five to 10 a day total in the clinic. So it was super slow, um, but it gave us a time to do a lot of the <clears throat> medical policy making and planning ahead that sometimes you wish you had time to do and didn't have time to put into place. Um, we were also setting up um, COVID precautions as far as a, a different facility on the off chance there was like a large COVID outbreak and people would be sick. We had it separate, set up a separate isolation facility. So that took up a lot of our time this particular year. Um, but your day-to-day -day is um, everybody works, I think about 10 hour days there, six days a week. Um, Sunday's an on-call day and there's someone on staff that's on call every evening. Um, everything is close. I mean, you're staying on base. You're not more than a 15 minute walk from any building max. Um, so <clears throat> you start your day off around 7.30, you go in there. We, every team, regardless of whether it's medical or not, usually has a, like a, a morning powwow to um, kind of see where everybody stands and make sure it's kind of like morning report. Everybody's on the same page with what patients are coming in and who's doing what. Um, and then you kind of divide up duties as far as are there field camp duties that we need to be doing? Are there certain meetings that need to be attended to? Um, so on and so forth. And what patients that do we already know we're coming in to see? And we might divide up the duties because certain people have um, uh, special skill sets that might be more inducive to seeing a particular patient. Um, but at the same time, if you want to, you know, buff up on your dental 
Stefan, you know that a couple of people have already called in and said that they need to come in to have some teeth checked. Um, and if there's time sparing, you might go in with one of the PAs that has a lot of dental experience and, and learn from them. So, and then your day ends around 5.30. Um, as a group, you often go and eat together in the galley. And then, um, like I said, there's two bars uh, on station. Uh, they run trivia nights and um, karaoke nights and, and just live music events and other things. And so a lot of people kind of go to those places to unwind. Um, there is a gym, um, uh, actually a, a couple of workout facilities. You can take hikes. And so a lot of people do those side of things on their off time. Let's see. Um, let me go back. Sorry, oh, go sorry. So I was gonna go back to Christine's question about does yeah. McMurdo do EMR paper records? Um, so unfortunately they're on paper and that's not for want of everybody to move to an electronic system. Um, the problem is um, UTMB is a contracted out facility or organization to help provide the medical care. And I can't remember how often that contract's renewed, but it's it's um, not a guaranteed or, or permanent contract, although the UTMB has been the provider for a long time now. Um, but if we were to get an EMR in place, UTMB would have to pay for it uh, and get it set up. And so the higher levels of management um, don't necessarily agree that that's the best use of resources, not knowing that they're gonna be able to keep that contract and anybody else coming in might choose to use a different EMR. Um, getting things, uh, data transferred that way would be a lot harder if you lost the paper records and they have to keep paper records every, anyways. And so we have built-in forms that we use so that everybody has a unified method of um, recording information, but it is all paper. And um, all that, there's two copies of it at any one point in time. Um, there's the electronic copy of a paper form <laughs> that's stored at McMurdo. Um, and then that form uh, is dropped onto, um, a folder that is uh, downloaded every 15 minutes or so at UTMB and they take those and print it out and put it into a chart and stick it into the chart room. And so that's the high tech way of how they transfer <laughs> medical records. Um, are orders for PT, OT and other staff verbal orders or documented somehow? Um, it's not the documentation that you would expect in a typical US facility. So there's nothing, if you are admitting someone, we do document as best as we can um, based on a paper method that you might've seen in the nineties. Um, I don't think there was any carbon copies or anything like that, but you do write it in there, then the nurse will come behind you and sign it off. Um, but even before you write it down, they already know what you're doing because you're in constant communication you're working in, this, in a small space together. And so um, there's, you can, they, they still want documentation when they're inpatient. Now, when they're outpatient, um, you're kind of doing everything on your own. And so you don't really have to provide verbal orders or documents. Uh, you might give a heads up to PT saying, hey, I'm going to send someone your way to get evaluated. Um, but, or you might ask someone to start up the x-ray machine to warm it up because you're anticipating that you're going to need it, but there's no orders that go around for that. Um, and Ashley said, do you have any advice for students looking to join the UTMB Aerospace Medicine Residency? Um, I think there's a, I could provide a little bit of advice, I guess, on this topic. Um, it's, a, it's a tough question to uh, ask. So um, obviously you guys realize that aerospace medicine is definitely a rapidly growing field um, and there are a lot of opportunities abound. Uh, and one of the choke points, unfortunately, is uh, training enough people to go and fill some of these opportunities. Um, and that's super unfortunate. A lot of it's uh, funding related. Um, and I'm not sure, although they anticipated to some extent that this um, need was going to have to occur at some point in time, they didn't have a lot of control of when and how that was going to occur. Um, so right now UTMB, I think has funding for up to six residents a year, but in any given year, their actual, or it has allowance from ACGME to have up to six residents a year, but in any given year, their funding might be down to one or two residents, um, which makes it a little tough. Um, as far as joining the residency, um, you know, definitely showing up to events like this, uh, going to uh, the national meeting, uh, asthma every year. It's a small community, and we were just talking about this earlier before um, this conference kind of or this meeting started. It's a really small community, and people will recognize uh, faces and names, and and uh, word gets around. And so, if you just start 
showing up to events and, and participating and getting your name out there, it goes a long way. Um, that's probably the biggest thing uh, as far as getting a leg up. Uh, only because if you're really interested, because it's such a small community, people will go like, huh, why haven't I heard this name before, seen this person in passing? Um, never feel um, afraid to just walk up to someone and introduce yourself, especially at the asthma meetings. Everybody is so super nice and laid back. It, it's a, a really nice community um, and they all love sharing their experiences. And so um, even at NASA as a resident, um, it's always encouraged that we just call up any of the flight surgeons anytime if we've never met them and we can just schedule a meeting to uh, either meet virtually with them uh, this year or usually in off years, you would just say, hey, do you mind grabbing lunch? You know, we haven't met before. I'd love to hear what research you're doing and what work you're doing and um, just to get to know you. And they almost invariably say yes. And so um, same thing, just reach out to people uh, and ask, see what projects they're on and get yourself involved. Um, see. What additional medical capabilities would you like to have had at McMurdo? Now, looking back, it's kind of hard to think. At the moment, you're always like, why don't we have this one thing? Or why don't we have this other thing? Um, in general, they're, they're really fairly well equipped. Um, there's not a lot that I'd ask for, um, especially going in, being completely naive to the situation. I felt like they had way more equipment than um, I would have wanted. And it was really funny. One day I was walking around, I was like, I really wish we had a panoptic scope because it's just getting really hard to look at these people's eyes using these old Welsh Allen devices. And someone goes, oh, we just brought one down on the last plane. And so we had a panoptic. Um, the, we have, they have a good structure going there. Things run a little slow and I, I would love an electronic EMR uh, and a better way to mine some data because there's so much research to be had down there just from a medical standpoint. Um, uh, and you know that research is applicable to space medicine um, because you know as we mentioned before the Antarctica is such a great analog. Um, those would probably be the biggest things I wish we had, but not a lot in terms of caring for the patient itself. Uh, am I missing any other questions? Um, what additional theoretical or practical training do your, during your residencies would you have wished to, for to prepare you for your stay in McMurdo? Um, so by training, I'm an ER uh, emergency medicine um, physician, um, which I think is super helpful. Um, but you have to realize also at the same time that you're not there to necessarily diagnose. You're there just to stabilize and decide if they can stay or not. Um, but that's a useful background. By all means, not necessary. They send all sorts of physicians down there. Um, what I do wish that I would have had more training in is like sports medicine, ortho type things. You see a lot of musculoskeletal injuries, sprains, strains. Um, I spent a lot of time with PT, just learning some of their techniques and basics. I mean, Shana, this is completely up your alley as far as the skill set you would need. Um, and then uh, the dental training would be really nice. Most years they provide a three day dental experience for any physician going down there. They weren't able to offer that this year um, just because of COVID. Um, but you walk into that room and you don't even know the names of all the equipments and devices or how to turn them on or use them. And so getting that ahead of time is super useful. Um, I would say the other thing that, you know, to prepare you for any, any one of these experiences is um, what you bring with you is what you have. And so you don't get to go to up to date or, uh, you know, uh, wiki EM or any other source to kind of look things up really quickly. Um, so you have to bring your own sources with you uh, and, and, and select wisely. It's nice that we have electronic copies of a lot of textbooks nowadays, but, um, you have to have all those things ready and with you ahead of time because, um, that information is not going to be readily available to you if you don't bring it yourself. Any other questions? I have one more question for you, just in case anybody needs like a moment to think about any last minute questions, but this is kind of a broad speculative big dreamer question in the sense that do you envision the role of a flight surgeon to remain ground-based the way it is now? Or do you think as the field expands that there might be a need for a flight role for a flight surgeon, if that makes sense? I think you cut out there for me for a second. Oh. Um, my question was, do you envision the role of the flight surgeon to remain ground-based kind of the way it is now? Can you guys hear me? 
you both, I have you both five by. You can hear us? I can hear you now again. Okay, perfect. Ask that question. Um, do I anticipate flight surgeons to be ground-based? And then I kind of lost the tail end of that question. Yeah, so basically right now it's mostly a ground-based role. And I was wondering if you thought that as the role progresses, that there'll be need for like a flight role as a flight surgeon, if that makes sense. Um, in Antarctica or? Just in, in, in aerospace in general. Yeah, so um, in aerospace in general, if we're talking about space missions and field missions, I definitely see that there's gonna be a role for ground-based, but maybe not terrestrial ground-based <laughs> per se. Um, and so, you know, if we ever set up this, uh, a gateway or some sort of small colony um, on even just the moon, not even looking as far as Mars, uh, I think that they would absolutely need some sort of experienced occupational preventative care driven aerospace Stand by, please. Next 20, 30 years on the moon, to be honest, I think that's where we're going. Awesome. I had a question actually, speaking of musculoskeletal rehab. Yeah. Um, how often did you use the ultrasound machine? This is something I use every day in my practice all the time, yeah. right? all the things. So I'm just wondering how often you, you broke that bad boy up. That's a great question. So um, it is definitely uh, provider specific, right? If you don't feel comfortable and haven't had a lot of training with the ultrasound machine, they might not ever use it their entire time there. So it depends who they send down there. I used it fairly often, um, maybe not every day. And that's partly because of our patient load, but um, definitely a couple times a week. If people came in with any type of belly pain, I would just kind of drop a probe on them. Kidney stones are a big issue, just like they are for the space station. Um, and it can happen in a young population. Once again, appendicitis can happen in a young population. And most of these people are fairly fit and, and in decent shape. And so you can potentially visualize um, appendicitis on an ultrasound. Um, and we use it for a lot of the musculoskeletal things, like you said. Um, so a great example is um, we had someone come in with an Achilles. Michelle, we've lost you temporarily and are standing by. Able to definitively say that they can't stay on the ice because it's it's too far gone that they probably need surgery. We don't make that decision, but we recommend highly. And um, something like that's not necessarily debilitating illness, you know, anywhere off the ice, but because it's slippery um, and it is still a lot of ice on that season and they have to be able to walk from building to building. There's no way to wheelchair around or anything else. Um, they're done. There's nothing we can do, unfortunately for that, even though it's not you know, your typical, what you would consider a typical medevac would be type condition. That was enough to take people out, so. Yeah, just for everyone who does an ultrasound every day, all the time, there's a lot of different probes on the ultrasound machine. You can use the curvilinear vascular probe or vascular probes to, to see deeper structures and the hockey, little hockey stick probe to take a look at uh, more surface structures, tendons and whatnot. And even if someone has a bad case of, of Achilles tendonitis that isn't getting better with, um, with just rest ice and whatever, they can be out, like they can be done. Yeah. Whatever it is they came to do, which is really very interesting. Um, so that, that kind of, that kind of medicine interests me, which brings yeah. me to the next question, which is what is the best way for an interested licensed physician to get involved outside of the UTMB program? If you happen to know the answer. As far as going down to Antarctica or just in space in general, oh, going down to Antarctica. Antarctica. So UTMB, like I said, holds the contract. And so you don't have to be a resident to, um, apply. We're just lucky that we get sent down there as part of our training. But the physicians that go down there have nothing to do with the residency and may not even know the residency exists. Um, so uh, you just go to the UTMB Polar Medicine Center for Polar Medicine Oper Polar Medical Operations C Center for Polar CPMO uh, UTMB CPMO website, and there should be a job um, job listings there, and they have job listings year round because they have to accommodate for the summer and the winter season. They're two separate seasons that they hire for. 
uh, and you just submit your application and, and uh, Dr. McKeith will reach out and, and set up interviews and see. And it just kind of depends on the timetable on, they have some physicians that go back year after year. The physician, the lead physician I worked with, this was his third season and he'd been to every single, he'd worked at every single station. Um, and he's worked both summer and um, winter seasons. So actually they go by seasons. So I think he, it might've been his fifth season, but third year, third or fourth year working. Um, and so he's a regular, but he can't stay there uh, season after season, year after year, um, partly for mental health reasons. And, uh, and partly because USAP does request that people don't stay there for longer than 14 months at a time. Is a little different this year and I think they made exceptions to get up to 20 some odd months but it takes a toll on some of the people regardless of whether they notice it or not being down there and that isolated for that prolonged period of time um, is a lot for most people even the most introverted person to handle. Thank you so much. I do have other questions but if other people do please chime in. Yeah, um, I see one question here. Were any of the injuries, specifically the MSK ones you saw in McMurdo, similar to the ones crew have on orbit either during non-mod ops or during an EVA? Um, you have some of your typical like wear and tear type uh, injuries that you might see. And for those, I think are similar. Um, unfortunately, we have a lot of other injuries at McMurdo that are related to falls, slips um, and weekend warrior activities. Uh, if you could believe that. So we had um, Achilles tendon in, uh, tears or partial tears. We've had a traumatic, um, they've had down there before traumatic uh, pneumothorax from um, uh, getting hit by a, while playing some sports activity. Um, and then your typical slips and falls, you can get fuchsias, you can um, break uh, femurs. And so all of those have happened in the past at some point in time. Uh, and those are things that you're much less likely to see um, on the ISS and even during an EVA. However, as we move to missions that uh, where we're on the moon or on uh, Mars, you might see some more of those injuries. Um, you're in, you know, regardless of how well SpaceX or any of these other uh, companies, including Boeing make their suits, they're still bulky. They still have a range of motion limitations. Um, you still have a higher risk for fall. And so some of those things um, may still occur, um, but the, probably the biggest similarities is just wear and tear of doing repetitive motion type things. We are coming up here on the hour just to give everyone kind of a time heads up. If there are any last minute burning questions for Dr. Chan, this is your moment. Yeah, for um, those of you guys that are interested, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, aside from UTMB, um, they do send occasionally residents from radiology, uh, UTMB radiology, go down there to help read films. Um, this is mostly for doing ultrasound things for, say, the gallbladder before um, people transition from McMurdo summer season to a winter season in South, uh, in South Pole Station. Uh, they don't go back to Christchurch to get their medical clearance. They'll get their medical clearance there. But to do that, they'll have a radiologist go down there to clear them from certain aspects. Um, but I highly encourage you guys to check out the UTMB uh, Center for Polar Medical Operations website uh, at their job listings. Um, they have job opportunities for physicians, PAs, NPs, uh, uh, dental work, um, flight, flight special, uh, specialized nurses. Um, and you can always take a pay cut. And if you don't want to be the lead physician, you can serve as the PA um, or NP, you know. Um, but for the experience, it's well worth it. Awesome. Well, we want to respect everybody's time and also your time, Dr. Chan. Thank you. Thank you so much for giving such an awesome presentation on your experience with polar medicine and sharing your wisdom with all of us who are trying to work our way in this niche but beautiful field of aerospace medicine. Um, I hope that you have a wonderful day and everybody else has a wonderful day. If anybody has any questions, as always, feel free to reach out to any of us. We really appreciate having everybody here with us. Come join us next month. I believe it's on March 13th, Shana. Yes, March 13th to hear Dr. Northrup talk. And aside from that, check out our website. We have new programming coming up and have a good rest of your Saturday. Adios, everybody. Thank you, Thanks, Dr. Guys. Chan. Thanks, Thank everybody. you. Take care.